The Orenhauer screens are a great example of taking a relatively simple unit and designing it in such a way that we lose the edges. And, and Hauer talked about a continuity within his line as he thought about these things. And I think that works really well to undermine the kind of unit in that system. So we're seeing a couple of screens, a couple of Erwin Hauer screens now. And uh, what's, what's maybe important about them is that they came, they started to be more widely disseminated at the point where digital fabrication and mass customization were being discussed. And so while the screens are a kind of simple repetition, the, the thought was being able to take something like this and begin to customize it. And there, there are some really great examples of this. What I want to do with this tutorial is to build up a kind of intelligence through a process, through a series of tutorials that will continue with each tutorial to add some complexity. And it takes you through the entire process of maybe beginning to understand something and break it down into its component parts and then start to deploy those through a set of grasshopper strategies. So let's start by looking at the, a couple of Erwin Hauer screens, and we'll take this as a basis to begin to work with it in Grasshopper. So we see the first screen here, and um, the, the units or the edges from one unit to the next are, are kind of removed here or have been worked over. If we look at this next example, we can both see the, the edges between the components as well as the way that it's broken down. And I love this screen and this strategy in particular for what we see here. And what this is showing us is simply that there's two mirrored components. And so if we begin to imagine this, or as I begin to draw these elements within a kind of simple framework, we can see it has thickness, And with these two elements, what would happen is that this edge would be connected here, this edge connected here, oh, sorry, here, this one here, and the one from the other side over there connected to here. And so it's two of the same components that are mirrored. This works because the overall system that we see, or the overall framework, as I'll call it, sits within something like this, right? And we can see these lines extending throughout in either direction. All of the, the framework is consistent. And so I, I want to start with an idea that we know that we can begin to vary that. What's nice when these components go together is we can see that, well, we can't necessarily see, but we understand from the image on the left to the image on the right, that these things fit together and it begins to create a continuity between these that works like this as I draw that. So if we go to the previous image, we can then get a sense of what this overall strategy may look like. If we start to draw some, I'm a little sloppy with that, but if we start to draw the overall framework between these elements, we get a sense of the repetition. If I zoom in on some of this, and I'll even maybe make this a little thinner, we start to get a sense of the continuity of this line as it moves behind, moves in front, and then moves behind again. So it's in this continuity that we can begin to think about this, but that continuity is broken tectonically like this. 
so that one of these elements, that's a little big, right, one of these elements is here, and another is here. But because they're mirrored and they flip, We get a sense for the way that that works. So let's take a quick look at this. And again, remembering here's the way that that's broken down. We know that there's a joint at these points. And really what I want to do for the first step within Grasshopper is to build a very simple understanding of what this might look like. And so I'm going to start actually with a diagonal with an with the understanding that if we have four points that determine our edges we can then get a series of elements related to this and by that what i mean is that we can from these corner points we can get a diagonal from that diagonal or actually even along the length let's say that we get a point along this line that's a certain percentage. Let's say that's 10% of that line, 10% of this line, same thing here, and whatever this percentage will be will be a variable, but we can get a line that moves like this and a line that moves like this. The other thing that we can get is another line which has to do with this location in space. And so let's say there's another variable here that's say 5% and 5%. Now we get a line that moves across here and the line that moves across here. So now we can locate these points in space. With that, and being able to locate this midpoint, what we're able to get is a line that moves like this. And this is going to be a tangent curve in Grasshopper, and it's going to use the tangency of this line, the tangency of this line, and the tangency of this line, so that that one element we can then repeat four times because we can find it by locating these and by locating these lines. So we'll go, we'll go from here up and around back to here. And we'll do that again on the other side from here around to here and here and around to here. The tangency is important because we want these lines to line up. We want these lines to line up across these and at these elements. So that being able to control the tangency will allow us to create this continuous or what appears to be a continuous curve that moves around like this. So let me go to just an open, to a simple sketch, and let's talk about how we're going to develop this really simply in a set of, well, simply within Grasshopper. And so I want to start with four points. What I'm also going to want to do is to be able to move those points so that maybe they're not rectangular or square. And, but what I know is with those couple of points, let's call them A, B, C, and D, I can draw a polyline between them. And same thing over here. And if I work in the way that I drew this a couple of minutes ago, 
I can begin to locate just given each of those lines a percentage, right? We know that we can locate its midpoint. And that's true whether or not they're consistent or not. We can always find the midpoint. And we can always evaluate a curve for a specific length. So let's say, maybe I'll change the colors again. Let's say we wanted to do 25, let's say 20% from either direction. And then, so with those lines, maybe these become our diagonal lines. And maybe at, if I said that was 20%, maybe 10%. And again, these will be a variable. This will give us our other edges. So given these lines, and given the ability to find the midpoint of any of these lines, and given that we have those lines, we can then work to develop a tangency between them. And remember, we have this as a tangent. This will curl up, meet this line at a tangent, come back and meet here at a tangent. Same thing along this side. And then as we flip that, we'll get the same thing in that we can get our tangency here, 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 and here. So most of what we're doing is repeating this four times for the four sides. But it's true when we have something that's also non-orthogonal, that we can continue to work with a percentage of our outside line and finding midpoints as a way to develop a really simple continuous curve within that. Then our last step is going to be to bring these together and create those two elements that we saw of the front and back so that we get our front side element and the back side element. And then that will just simply be from our two elements, we can then repeat those. And so that element that we see here is what we saw down here, is between these. So let's start and we'll start kind of simply creating our four points creating a polyline, and then starting to break this down into its simplest elements. So let's open Grasshopper and see how this will work.